afternoon. You are with the House Government Operations and Judiciary Committees. Um, we are back in session here this afternoon, um, I think with a more uh, focus and intention of, um, of working on S219. Um, we have taken a jog through and, and, uh, and, and talked about each of the sections. And I think there are a few specific areas that we need to come back to uh, that is the intention that we would talk about um, about these things right now so that we can get some uh, another draft in front of the committees. Uh, the question um, at hand uh, immediately is around um, body cam data policy. Um, Maxine, you've got your hand up. Um, right, for, um, for two things, but um, in terms of this, I really appreciated what Hal had said about having a non-governmental um, organization that has the capacity. Um, and I was, I was thinking along those lines, could ACLU host it? I, I don't know, but, um, but I do think it is really important um, to have a non-governmental agency. Uh, so I just, I wanna second that. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is I wanted to call everybody's attention to um, Representative Ann Donahue sent um, some more testimony, which, um, which I really appreciate and find helpful. And it, it might help us um, move forward in terms of our um, intent language and some of the uh, issues that we're still grappling with. So it may have only been emailed to, to you and me, Sarah, I have to, I have to look. Yeah. But I wanna, make I wanna make sure everybody has access to that. Great. So um, Ann Donahue and Brian Tina have been um, a part of, or following along on these conversations because they were both um, sponsors, uh, original sponsors of bills in the house that touch on many of the subjects that we're working on here. So um, we had invited them to, to be paying attention to what was going on and, uh, and sharing their feedback with us. Um, so I believe we have Tanya Marshall with us and Tanya on the subject of um, of uh, body cam data policy, we're, we are, as you have just heard, moving towards the idea of <clears throat> finding a convening entity who can, uh, who can help flesh out some of the issues around uh, body cam data uh, in order to bring that a recommendation back to the legislature and I would welcome you to share your thoughts. Sure, um, so I'm Tanya Marshall, State Archivist and Chief Records Officer for the State of Vermont. I'm also the, the Director of the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration, which is in the Office of Secretary of State. And um, I'm not sure what both committees are aware, but Act 172 of 2006 actually did require the State Archivist to work with the Department of Public Safety and other um, statewide criminal justice agencies to, um, and I'm gonna look sideways on my screen if you see me doing that, just to quote it, and I did send it out to um, um, Andrea is to have and develop recommendations and action plans for these agencies to meet their records retention and evidence requirements related to body worn camera footage. Um, and uh, that work has actually been done. Um, so underneath our statutes for the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration, we, um, we established retention requirements for all public records. Um, that is in Title I, 317A. That is our charge. Um, that is not something new uh, per se. It's been in the books since 1937. So different entities have done that um, over time. And now that sits with the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration. So um, we do establish record schedules. That's what it is. It gives a life cycle for the records and information. It doesn't matter if it's paper, electronic, digital, or data. Um, and last year, this came up in um, regards to house appropriations and when there was a request, um, you know, to allocate funds related to body worn camera specifically to Department of Public Safety and State Police. So we worked a pretty active engagement working through um, all of that because they already had dashboard 
footage. Uh, so as part of that process, we've developed record schedules. They have been issued to uh, both state and local law enforcement agencies, so they are out there. Um, we also worked with the Department of Public Safety on a very comprehensive uh, records and information management policy uh, that is uh, specific to you know what they currently have. So they don't use body work cameras, but they do use dash um, and work through the retention based on different incidents, different different cases, how might something might go for internal review, um, a number of different scenarios for that. And that particular policy um, has been circulated out um, through, I think, public safety to local law enforcement. And so we've been working with them too. So um, in terms of uh, the way the schedules do work is that if there is a new statutory change or some legal requirement that uh, requires a change in management, then we work with um, getting that particular um, policy document updated um, and, and set forth and then work with the public agencies that are affected by those changes. Um, but this work has been done when it comes to retention, management, those schedules also include any exemptions to public access. Um, and then what we do is that we have the high level policy, this is the record schedule that's required under law um, for each public agency. If they want to destroy records, they have to have that particular schedule in place um, approved by the state archivist and issued by the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration. And then um, what what happens from there if there is a change then we use the internal policies on the day-to-day -day management aspects for that information and we'll help the public agencies address their policy changes as well so hopefully that provides some background um, because it was something that was required our through the big bill in um, 2016. Thank you, Tanya. Any questions from either committees on what we've just heard? All right, I'm not seeing anyone diving in with their hands to raise. Um, I noticed that um, Ann Donahue's email, I think has been posted on the judiciary page. Is that what I'm seeing in the chat? box here well um she had testimony yesterday but it's um but also testimony this morning so i want to make sure that that her additional testimony from um from this morning gets posted okay so uh let's make sure that we um take a moment to review that um martin uh yes i, I was wondering if uh, uh tanya if if you've had an opportunity to review the <clears throat> the body the model body worn camera policy uh, of LEAB, uh, the Law Enforcement Advisory Board, uh, the section regarding storage and documentation, and if that's consistent with, I assume that that's consistent with. Yeah, last year we um, when it when it came up through House Appropriations, I worked with the. Um, through the Commissioner of Public Safety. And so we reviewed that part of it, but we haven't engaged back on that front because I usually use the agency and department that's most directly related to engage. So I haven't reviewed it recently since the work that we've done last year, uh, but the new schedules were issued. So those um, schedules are required for all agencies and departments. They have to comply with the record schedules issued by the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration to destroy any records. So I'd have to go back and review it unless Department of Public Safety has already done that. I'm not, I'm not personally aware um, ha what has happened since the schedules got issued in the Department of Public Safety kind of work through its own policy. All right, thank you. Yep, I'm happy to do that if that's of interest to have some feedback on that. All right, other questions from committee members? Okay, so I think what I'd like to do is um, is ask James Lyle if he would um, share thoughts with us on um, on a non governmental convening entity who could help um, help establish what uh, what various stakeholders think is an adequate policy. Hi, sorry, I'm just logging in a few minutes late. Um, 
And just, I just want to be clear because I'm a couple of minutes late. You were talking specifically about an adequate body camera policy. Yes. And understanding that you testified yesterday that you have a model policy. What we, uh, what the committees here discussed this morning was that, uh, that we wanted to convene a, a working group to make sure that we've got stakeholder input and that it's not being driven either by DPS or by you know any particular government entity, um, but that it is getting input from uh, from both governmental and um, and uh, citizen led groups. Yes, I mean, we'd absolutely be interested in in exploring that and and leading that effort if if called upon to do so. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, committee members, thoughts, suggestions, discussion about this concept. Uh, John Gannon. Thank you. Um, James, um, how long do you think it, it would take to put together um, a policy um, for Vermont? Um, and especially getting enough different communities involved in that process? Um, well, as um, as I mentioned yesterday, we, we submitted with our testimony yesterday, the ACLU's sort of national recommended model legislation for regulation of police body cameras. Um, we would view that as a, as a starting point, or at least we would, we would offer it as our recommended starting point. Um, and, but uh, I guess depending on, uh, on what kind of process, uh, is recommended or set up. Um, you know, I, I don't personally have a lot of experience um, convening stakeholder groups. <laughs> um, I, I think we would be open to, um, you know, a process that is, uh, that is reasonable and obviously inclusive of diverse viewpoints. Um, I mean, we don't have un obviously unlimited capacity. Um, we're, we are a small organization in the state, although we do have as I, as I said yesterday, extensive uh, experience with this with this topic. Um, so I, I mean, I, I think we would be open to um, uh, any number of models. Uh, but as I say, the the policy that we submitted with our testimony, we you know that's the policy that we developed over years and have revised it um, as we've learned through the years uh, about some of the things that are needed. It's not to say it's necessarily perfect. Um, or, or that you know further inputs aren't needed. Great. No, and I've read the policy. It's very extensive. And obviously, you, yesterday in testimony, you offered um, to bring in experts to help craft a, a Vermont policy. So I mean, that would be helpful. Um, but I guess your only concerns is about convening a group to make sure we get the right voices. Yeah, and you know, there I, I would welcome inputs there as well, just in terms of. How, how to structure it, what the timeline would be. Um, you know, we are, we're obviously a non-governmental, small organization. Um, so uh, I'm open to, to really anything, um, but I, I think I, I would look to others with maybe more experience <laughs> convening these, these, these kinds of groups or task forces or, or what have you uh, as to how, how, that, how that might run. Maxine, go ahead and jump in. Oh, thank you. But I, I there were other hands up before me, so I don't I don't mind waiting. Okay, but thank you. I've heard it. Oop, thank you. Um, so uh, I lost my train of thought. So uh, the the committee or, or the the both committees are are kind of uh, uh, from what I've heard are leaning toward uh, Department of Public Safety, not not convening a group. Um, and, you know, if that's the will of the committee, that's the will of the committee. But, and, and, uh, and from what, not your words, but from, from what I heard you say is that you wouldn't feel comfortable convening the group. Would you feel comfortable with somebody like the uh, Secretary of State uh, convening the group? I'm sorry, is that a question to me? Yes, oh, I'm sorry, yes, it sorry, is. Sorry, sorry, I just, I just I didn't hear that part, I apologize. <laughs> Um, I didn't address you at the beginning. I should have. Quite all right. Um, um, 
Yeah, uh, like I say, I, I'm. I think we'd be open to um, to a, just about anything. Um, the Secretary of State is is a possibility, and and obviously they have expertise on matters of you know transparency and sort of the overlap with public records um, that I think could be valuable. Not to volunteer them in their absence. Um, and you know, I think it's possible that we could. Um, act as a convener or, or a host or, or you know, uh, lead the effort. I don't want to rule that out. I just, um, you know, again, I, I don't have some, I, I could speak with my colleagues about this further, about whether we have the capacity and experience um, to do that or whether I'm like the Secretary of State to do it. I'm definitely open to, uh, to exploring those options. Yeah, and I brought up the Secretary of State because it was brought up earlier today. It's that's not my thought. So, <laughs> um, to me, the, the the important thing is is uh, to have uh, everybody represented uh, that needs to be represented, and everybody who every uh, uh, community that is represented is listened to. You know, and, and it doesn't matter if it's you know if it's law enforcement or you know racial uh, community, but. Um, that that would be the most important thing to me. Yeah, I, I, I agree, and I think it's also just important that you know the legislature retain responsibility for um, signing off on and reviewing the policy, and that you know that no entity, whether it's law enforcement, ACLU, or anyone else, have, have necessarily the final word um, on. Oh, the, definitely, the, definitely the compiled. So yeah. maybe that goes without saying, but um, great. Thank you. Thank you, Bob Hooper. Uh, I would just be repeating, but as long as, you know, it's as much a neutral arbiter as possible uh, convening and as long as both sides of the camera front and back are represented, I think that's where we should end up. Maxine? Uh, so one question is whether or not this is being addressed in S-124. And, uh, and if so, how? And then another thing is, um, if there's some way that if we, um, given that we want to make sure that we want to get impacted communities involved in this process, um, I would hope there's some way for them to get um, compensated. And, um, and does that mean we therefore need to create a board or a task force uh, with appointments in order to, to do that? So it's more, it's more your wheelhouse in government operations. Yes, it would it would require us to designate that uh, that there should be per diems available and, uh, and then of course that would trigger this bill to go to appropriations before it goes to the floor. Can't do it. No. Uh, Commissioner Sherling has a hand up. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, just briefly. Um, I am not familiar with the background uh, from 2016 uh, on the body camera policy development uh, as I was in commerce at the time, um, but I've read through the ACLU draft and it strikes me that either what we've got in uh, the state police policy um, largely mirrors what's there and anything that doesn't, I think we're pretty close. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think that there's a tremendous amount of room, if any, uh, between that model national policy that uh, that James has shared and the be the current best practice. I think we've got to go through it a little bit further. Um, but with that as the background, um, you know, I would I would also urge the committee not to abdicate the role of government in developing our own policy. Um, again, I don't know what the history was from sixteen. Um, and why there was daylight between uh, various components. Um, I think there's far less daylight, if any, uh, at this stage, but I also would urge the committee not to outsource um, you know, core government functions, including developing our own policy um, to external stakeholders in its entirety. Engaging stakeholders and ensuring that that feedback is taken into account is essential, but abdicating that role, I think, is a bit of a slippery slope.
Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Martin? Um, yeah, I, I guess uh, just a response to that is that as long as the legislature would be uh, having final approval of a policy, we wouldn't really be abdicating the government's involvement. But having said that as well, uh, it see, I mean, it, we're having difficulty trying to figure out who has the capacity and who is who can do this. And and we have, I think, a, there's a couple options. There are downsides to them, uh, as far as entities that already exist. I'll, I'll start with the one that's less uh, desirable, and that that would be the the council, the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council. Um, and, and the second one, it would be the Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice System Advisory Panel, or, or RDAP. Uh, I know that there are, uh, both of those are, are heavily weighted to, uh, to government uh, involvement, but we could have one of those entities uh, be convening this and make it very clear that for the purposes of reviewing this policy and coming up with uh, I mean, a separate suggestion is where we start there, but, but let me finish this part first. It, it is that we can ensure that ACLU has a seat, that other uh, entities have a seat. Uh, I mean, we can go through and, and uh, racial uh, justice alliance. I mean, we can, I'm sure that we can come up with the list of those that, uh, and leave it open for others as well. But just, so we have that entity that can actually convene this and has the capacity to do so, but then make sure for the purposes of review of this policy that we, we have a broad inclusivity. Um, the other point I would make is that it's rather than just starting from scratch, and, and, and this would come in part because of what is in the S-124, uh, which, uh, as I understand how it was passed, the Senate is that uh, the key language, and really I think the only language regarding this is honor before January 1st, 2022, seems a long time off. Each law enforcement agency, agency shall adopt, follow and enforce the model body worn camera policy established by the law enforcement advisory board. Uh, so uh, for this, for what we're doing, we could have uh, the start be a review of that policy uh, with the appropriate people at, at the table. I mean, if we want to kind of really put some sideboards around this. I, I, I raise that as a possibility. I, you know, I haven't completely thought it out, but just for discussion. Reactions to that? Go ahead, James. Sorry, I don't know if there's a... Uh an icon to raise my hand or if I should just do it the old fashioned way. But in any case, I, I, I mean, I just wanted to you know, respond to that point. Um, I think Representative Lund is, is right that we absolutely need not and should not start from scratch. Um, we, I mean, we feel that we have a, a strong policy. Um, uh, there is the LEAB policy, um, which, you know, we responded to that and, and identified the issues that we had with it. Um, and, you know, whether there are only a few uh, points of contention between our policy and our position and that of the LAB, LEAB policy, or whether there are, you know, fewer or, or more uh, issues or, or, you know, wider gaps between them, um, you know, those might be starting points or reference points. Um, and I, I mean, I would absolutely encourage, and I think others, even over the last couple of weeks, have testified on, you know, additional issues that they have have identified either with, with our policy um, or body cameras in general. So I think it's, it's absolutely important to invite in other stakeholders to comment on either of these policies. But it's just to say, I, I think, I mean, that could even be um, done in the course of some hearings, as opposed to convening an entire stakeholder group. I mean, you, you essentially have two policies that have uh, significant work has been done on both of them. And maybe they're far apart, maybe they're not all that far apart as Commissioner Sherling suggested. Um, but, you know, we might be closer to having a, a good policy that there's broad consensus on. I think maybe with some additional input and some more time to vet those, you know, we might not need to 
convene another task force or, or certainly not start from scratch as, as Representative Lalonde said. Thank you, I can appreciate that. Rob LeClaire has his hand up. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I certainly agree with the, the concept that we're talking about here is kind of a, a public private partnership. Um, I'm not sure that I'm comfortable that the ACLU should be the automatic default agency that we, we go with here. Um, I don't necessarily view them as totally impartial. I would like to know what other organizations are out there that would meet that criteria, that have the ability and the bandwidth to do this. Um, and I'm not sure that using their policy as the default to start with is the right way to go either. Um, we have our own body cam policies, I know with BSP and other agencies. Um, so I'd like to know what other options there are out there besides uh, the ACLU. Thank you. So, you know, it occurs to me that um, um, a subcommittee of these two committees could certainly do some work on this um, as effectively and, um, and we could, um, you know, be the, uh, the conveners with the intention of uh, hearing from a broad group of stakeholders, I guess. So I, I'll just flag that as, um, as a possible model of how we move forward with this. Um, but I guess I would uh, defer to Maxine to, to give us sort of a sense of where you think we should move at this point in our consideration of, um, of this bill. Should we keep zeroing in on the plan for developing a body cam policy, or should we take a step back and look at some of the broader issues? Um, I don't know if it's possible to hear from, from Betsy Ann, but if I wonder if it would be helpful to know uh, what's happening in S or happened in S124. Yeah. I see that Betsy Ann is with us at the moment. And um, so Betsy Ann, can you help us understand what S124 um, says with respect to body cam policy? Hi everybody, I don't, I'm sorry why my screen is so blurry. Um, so the bill S124 that the Senate just approved yesterday would say that starting on January 1st, 2022, Every agency shall uh, adopt, follow, and enforce the body camera policy that the LEAB established in 2016, um, and that every officer would be required to follow that policy. But the way that we, the committee reads it and understands it, and I as well, is that the LEAB policy applies if an officer is given a body camera, and so it is not necessarily a requirement for all officers to use a body camera. So it's just, if an officer is given a body camera, it has to be used in accordance with the LEAB um, model policy. Also included in S-124 as Senate proposed to amend it yesterday is that there will be progress reports on miscellaneous issues. Um, that would have to be provided to the GovOps committees. And one of those is a report back on whether there should be any changes to the LEAB model policy before that requirement to comply with it takes effect on January 1st, 2022. Questions for Betsy Ann? Mark. So, so what, what is the entity that's uh, looking further at the policy that's going to be reporting back? It It is the LEAB and then I think the language that they voted out um, requires the LEAB to discuss with um, at least several different rel um, named entities in determining whether to uh, propose amendments to the LEAB policy. So it's mostly on the LEAB but with some requirement to uh, discuss it with other entities before making any recommended changes to the policy. Martin, does that 
Does that help? Yeah, yeah, I think I found the, the language from the from the bill um, that yes, yeah, I see that that specifically names ACLU uh, that they have that the LEAB has to consult with the ACLU. I know I guess the question for uh, for James is is whether you've had a chance to look at this language in 124 and if that's where we should be dealing with this issue. Um, so I haven't seen, I'm not looking at the language right now. Um, my, my understanding, so our senior staff attorney, Lee Ernst was the, our lead on this back in 2016. And so she could speak to this in more detail uh, than I can. And, and she, she could be available to do that if, if called upon. But um, my understanding is that, yes, the ACLU was consulted on somewhat after the fact and our recommendations were um, not, not taken up. Um, Again, Le Leah Ernst can speak to that better than I can, um, but I think it goes to sort of the the issue that I was, you know, speaking to yesterday. Um, I mean, if the LEAB is the starting point, uh, you know, other stakeholders need to have meaningful consultation. You know, we we would say it shouldn't be ignored, and, and ultimately, it's the legislature's responsibility to to determine if the LEAB policy is adequate, just like it would be the responsibility to determine if the ACLU policy is adequate. Um, um, I'm not, uh, I mean, the ACLU obviously uh, is in favor of broad transparency and accountability. So to the extent we have an agenda, that is it. Uh, law enforcement uh, has its own agenda, which tends to be less in favor of transparency and accountability, to be blunt. Um, so I think, you know, whoever it is that's drafting the policy or holding the policy has um, has inclinations uh, towards what that what that policy should be and where on the spectrum of transparency and accountability and due process and those kinds of issues uh, we should fall. Um, but um, you know, again, I, I think um, whether it's our policy or the LEAB policy, we do have a lot of work that's gone into it. I also think, um, it, you know. Uh, this is not obviously the only issue that we're going to have to be working on, you know, going forward. And, and I just don't want too much uh, oxygen to get sucked up by a body camera policy, which for the state police, um, which although important is a small fraction of, of what needs to be done. So I'm also thinking about that in terms of our capacity to participate in the process when there, there are many other police reforms that are urgently needed that we need to be moving forward in addition to a model body camera policy. Uh, Commissioner Sherling has um, has a question and then I'll go to Tanya Marshall. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just two uh, additional side notes for the committees. Um, one, just a note that the, the LEAB exists by statute to advise you and the governor and me on policy. So just for background, also in 124, uh, there are updates to the makeup of the LEAB that have uh, been proposed to widen participation. Thank you. Um, Tanya Marshall, do you, do you have thoughts on what um, you're hearing? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm just I'm just focused on for the Secretary of State's office, which I'm part of, you know, we do, we're, we're we're pretty objective in how we do records management and records and information management. And so in regards to that part, our charge is to make sure that we're using industry standards and best practices. And so in terms of the committee, when it comes to retention and disposition of records on um, that work, I do want to clear clarify that was just done within the last year and solidified. So um, I would want to have active in involvement or to kind of have clarity if the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration, although it would be very unusual in statute to exclude us because that is our role. Um, so and um, so I just want to kind of point that out when it comes to retention um, and disposition, regardless of format, is that um, the work that has been done recently on the records retention schedules and walking through were based on industry standards and best practices as and in addition to Vermont law. Um, those schedules are just revised and issued out in um, August of 2019. Um, and the policy went into effect in terms of the records management policy 
policy, which is inclusive, a lot more law enforcement records. Um, the policies that we're starting to see come out early this year. So it was just January that they started to get implemented within the law enforcement agencies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions from committee members. So we're building a plane here while we're flying it. Um, Maxine. Exactly. <laughs> so if I can just sort of say what's going through my mind, um, just throwing this out for further discussion because I, I do feel that we are somewhat stuck. So. So what I'm thinking is, uh, I wonder, um, in uh, uh, 219 section six, um, I think that's a good statement of policy. So maybe, you know, have that. Um, look at 124, I, um, I haven't actually physically looked at the language, but um, wondering if we mirror that language um, here in this bill. Some, somehow we need to reconcile and then and then make sure in our intent when we talk about involving impacted communities, uh, make sure that we are very clear in terms of um, that we wanna get input on whether it's um, use of force and new crime policies, but, but you know, somehow make it, make it clear that, that we wanna um, have this discussion be inclusive in terms of what um, policy to to adopt. Um, another thing I'm thinking of is when we did the fair and impartial policing years ago, we had a model policy and we said something like every department shall, what was it, um, adopt, you know, at a minimum certain elements um, of the model policy. And so maybe something like like that, and that the, you know that the stakeholder group would would look at um, ACLU and, and and other policies in determining a model policy. So that's what's <laughs> turning around in my mind right now. I can appreciate that. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that? Um, I just ask a real quick question. Can can uh, Betsy Ann send us the language that actually has been passed out of the Senate? I couldn't really determine exactly what language on 124. Yeah, Betsy Ann, it might be helpful if you just extracted that and sent it via email to both committees. I know that folks following along from the public can probably um, get the current copy of 124 um, from the Senate calendar, but we need to zero in uh, exactly on that. Hello, I actually just did. I sent the updated uh, amendment. So we don't have a full as passed uh, Senate version yet. That should happen uh, soon, but I just did send to uh, both committees the uh, follow-up amendments that the Senate passed yesterday to S-124. So you should have received that in your email or uh, will shortly. Um, and the body camera language, if you're speaking to that specifically now, there is on page four, um, the new requirement for agencies and officers to follow the LEAB body camera policy starting on July 1st, 2022. And then the language about um, the, the progress reports um, on miscellaneous law enforcement recommendations are in the fifth instance of amendment, which begins on page six. And then body cameras are specifically addressed starting on page nine, line 11. And just to confirm it, it actually is just the LEAB alone that is to report any changes it deems necessary to that policy. But it goes on to say that after consulting with the Secretary of State, the Human Rights Commission, ACLU, and other interested parties, the LEAB is to specifically recommend policies for responding to public records requests for body camera footage, including any recommended timelines to respond, how and what footage should be redacted, length of footage retention, and storage. And can I just real follow-up, quick follow-up question? 
uh, for Betsy Ann. Uh, what about the language regarding the makeup of the LEAB? Is that in this or is that elsewhere? That was in the underlying S-124 um, uh, strike all amendment proposed by Senate GovOps. And I can provide that to you also, but it was uh, just adding additional law enforcement members to the LEAB, including the uh, chief of Capitol Police and uh, law enforcement officers from DMV and I believe maybe uh, Fish and Wildlife, but I, I, I think it was just adding law enforcement members to it. Well, that was the wrong direction, but okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, Selena? Um, yeah, I was actually gonna respond to something Maxine said um, prior. And I'm, I may not have fully understood you, Maxine, but I think you, you when you were referencing the fair and impartial policing and you talked about sort of the, the, the baseline model policy um, that, that folks were met, you know, had to adopt at a minimum. I, I, I wasn't um, on the Judiciary Committee when you all developed the fair and impartial policing, the initial fair and impartial policing legislation, but I think that floor ceiling thing has been um, really problematic, actually. And so I would, I would advocate that if we're going to, um, you know, beyond the Vermont State Police, if we're going to um, push for ad adoption of a model policy that we just, it just be the one policy that we think is actually the right policy and not sort of give those kinds of, you know, up and down outs and that also just cause confusion then about how, what the ceiling could be. Um, so just my two cents on that. Thanks, Selena. Tom had a hand up earlier. Go ahead, Tom. Thank you. Um, just what's going through my mind is that uh, the commissioner was talking about the, the um, some policy that he has and uh, I don't know if he wrote it from the ACLU's model policy, but he did mention that a lot of it uh, mirrors uh, what they're doing. So it, it almost makes me wonder how much work we really have to do on this. If, if he's, uh, and I, I'm gonna, uh, I know I shouldn't assume, but <laughs> I, I'm gonna assume that a lot of the uh, stakeholders in uh, you know, community members that may be involved in this would probably um, lean toward what the ACLU might want to do and, and what's in their model policy. So it, it just makes me wonder, again, how much work there is to do. And if, uh, you know, if, if the ACLU could uh, look at the policy that uh, DPS has, and we may have very few points to you know, to, uh, to go over and debate. It, it may be a lot easier and a lot quicker um, and, and a lot simpler than we're making it. I don't disagree with you, I guess, on that. Um, and, and I think the, but the, the reality is that we don't, uh, we don't have the ability to figure that out right now in the context of this bill. And so what we need to do is set a direction and a, and a plan either, um, either in the intent section here um, or in some other way. So Maxine, what are your thoughts? on? Could that be part of the intent that the ACL, I almost said UCLA, ACLU uh, reviews uh, the policy that DPS has in place? So Maxine, can I give you um, facilitation of this? Because I've got to jump onto a call with the speaker for about five minutes on a, a CRF bill. So I'm going to hand this over to you and I'll be back to help in a moment. Great, thank you. So, so what I'm thinking is uh, take a pause on this because I think it'd be helpful if we could, if we could read um, S124 and, and the um, relevant uh, provisions and, uh, and maybe just clear our heads a little bit about that um, and come back to it. Uh, I know that Bryn um, does have a new draft of the um, 
of the bill, the, um, you know, given the amendments, the discussion we had um, earlier. So I'm wondering maybe if we could go take a look at that. I think it needs to be posted and sent to us. And, uh, you know, make, make sure that it's Mike Sherling. I apologize for interrupting. I'm not yeah. going to be able to be with you again this afternoon. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I yep, did sorry. just want to flag that in Section 6, that first paragraph that specifies when uh, the Department of Public Safety is to use video cameras is problematic. It is incongruous with both our existing policy and the ACLU's model and would create uh, recordings in a variety of different scenarios that I don't think you intend to create recordings. So I would put that piece on hold. Okay, thank you. Um, James, I see, uh, do you wanna, can you comment please? Do you want to? Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, the, the, I believe both policies are, are pretty clear about when um, cameras should be on and when they should be off. Um, and and uh, just the only other thing I was gonna say is um, just to, draw attention back to one of the documents we submitted yesterday, uh, which was our response to the LEAB policy, which lays out um, you know, about a dozen ob objections or things that we feel are missing. Um, and so that, um, that is there um, and possibly needs updating. This was a, several, a few years ago anyway. Um, and, and lastly, I think, I don't know if this is a viable option, but one thing I think we suggested yesterday was that um, you know, our view is that there shouldn't be body cameras until there's a good policy in place. So um, I don't know if there's, if it's possible to uh, change the language to, um, you know, to, to move forward with body cameras, but just make clear that until the, um, you know, legislature reviews and finalizes a model body camera policy looking to LEAB and or ACLU, um, you know, until such time as that happens, the, these body cameras won't be in use or something to that effect. Um, so that, you know, um, potentially you can move forward, but also ensure that, that there's uh, a policy that, that is in place. Um, and, and again, I, I would um, agree that it does not have to be a, a situation where we're starting from scratch, um, but maybe reconciling some of the existing documents we have and inviting a little bit more uh, input in, in, in a subcommittee or in a hearing. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, Martin and then Barbara. Yeah, on, on that issue, I guess it's one problem is that uh, there are agencies that are using body cameras already. I, I know it's troubling that they're using it without, well, presumably they're looking at some sort of policy internally that we may or may not like. Uh, so I'm wondering, uh, James, if you could comment if, if the better of the many evils that we're talking about here is if in in section six uh, that that uh, anybody who's using the body cameras has to be following at least the LEAB so long as we're separately we're dealing with the fact that that policy needs to be updated uh, with with some of the concerns that you've listed in your letter but at least it would make it so law enforcement is has a policy that you know may not be strong as we want it but has has some of the protections that we want uh because i it seems highly unlikely that we'd be able to push this through with uh saying no more body cameras until we have a policy since a lot of the some agencies have already adopted them Right. No, I, I understand. I mean, my understanding was that this, this legislation is specifically about DPS body cameras. And so I guess my point was that um, state police should not be using, obtaining and using body cameras until they have a policy. Um, but, it, you know, your point goes to, you know, I think uh, the broader issue that we have sort of a patchwork of some law enforcement agencies in the state have body cameras and their own policies. I don't know offhand which of those are stronger or weaker than the LEAB policy. Um, so I don't know, for example, if Burlington's offhand, I mean, again, my colleagues um, who are deep into this might, might know offhand, um, you know, whether a given local agency has a policy that is stronger than the LEAB, um, where, you know, uh, 
so, so, I mean, we have a patchwork system and it's not unlike the FIP. And I, I agree with Representative Colburn that um, there, there are issues with creating floors and ceilings. Um, but to the extent you wanna look at all law enforcement in the state and, and what policies they should be following, you could for now say that at a minimum they should be following the LA, LEAB policy. I, I think so long as you know, we would feel very strongly that we recognize that that policy is not nearly strong enough, is, is not an adequate policy and needs to be fixed. So whether we're talking about it for all state law enforcement or whether we're just talking about the provisions in the bill, which as I understand it are, are directed at DPS. Um, and, and that and raises another interesting issue because S-124 is uh, talking about applying the policy to each law enforcement agency. And I'm assuming that means all law enforcement agencies by January 1st, 2022. So there's another thing that we have to kind of figure out between the two bills. All right, thanks. Okay. Not seeing any other hands. Um, Barbara, did you? So Martin actually started the issue the issue that I was concerned about, but it raises for me the issue of do we want police departments all over the state following whatever policy they want? I was not envisioning this just being the state police. Um, and um, in looking at Representative um, Tana's concerns, I am concerned too about other uh, technology that's being used that we haven't last and that leads to some of the same concerns. Um, so I want to look at this amendment more carefully, but facial recognition is going to be problematic. And yeah, like I don't know how to not keep making this bigger and more of a snowball, but on the other hand, it's gotten out of hand. I mean, I think that we ha are seeing from body cameras that technology is not being regulated and being used and we need to get on top of it. So I guess that's my big point. So if I could just follow up on that real quick. Yeah, sure. so, so I do think still for purposes of section six, uh, I mean, if, if the we can, we, one of two things, we say the state police aren't going to use this until the policy is completed and we've done a re-review or we go ahead with this and say that uh, they have to follow the LEAB policy, you know, recognizing that we are proceeding with updating that policy uh, through this other process. It seems it has to be one or the other, or you just take it out completely like uh, the commissioner said. But the, I'm worried that if we say follow that policy and we don't really feel that it is a policy because it isn't covering all the areas we have, we're giving it more authenticity and authority than we might want to. I mean, that's, right. that's why the other, the other component would have to be pretty clear that right. we have this other process uh, that's gonna be very inclusive to update that policy. Right. I think, yeah, I think I'm leaning towards taking it out because uh, similar to what Barbara's saying that if we, if we leave it in and we add, you know, another policy that we're not thrilled with and it's often harder to take something, it's that just may become the policy, you know. Um, I guess, Maxine, real quickly on that, though, the Section 7 still says, shall immediately initiate the acquisition and deployment. So so by taking that out, yeah. you have no policy whatsoever if we're taking out 6 and leaving 7. Well, I haven't gotten to 7 yet. <laughs> so, uh, which, is, which is why I was wondering if it, it would be helpful for us to take some time individually and read 124 and see if that gives us any guidance unless somebody has read it or is more familiar and can say you know no it doesn't help us but um i'm, I'm just concerned that we may be spending a lot of time on this and that that the answer may be elsewhere or with a little bit of a break from it it might become 
come clearer. So I so think that's from, oh, I'm sorry. To just yeah, go ahead. Uh, I think I, I can't, I like who's been reading three different things at once, at least here. Um, so I may have missed something, but I think S124 is pretty reliant on the um, LEAB policy and it's not clear to me. And maybe I just missed it. Um, what the, I mean, they're expanding the, Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council, but it's not really, I'm not sure they give a lot of guidance about the adoption of the LEAB policy unless I read it too quickly. Okay, Sarah, go ahead. Um, I'm just gonna throw out another potential way forward. Um, and that is that uh, in the in S219 section six becomes effective on August 1st. Um, what if we push that back to October 1st and um, and established the process that we're going to use to make sure that we've evaluated the LA, LEAB model policy um, with input from from the broader stakeholder group. Um, and that we would have it as our intention to, uh, to, to pass a model policy in, uh, in the August, September session so that it would be able to go into effect before the body cams are, are deployed. I think that could work, but I feel like we still haven't um, quite figured out what that stakeholder process for finalizing the LEAB would would be. Right, and um, you know, I we've talked a little bit about the concept of you know having a, a short term working group. Um, but then also feeling like if we were going to ask people to work for hours and hours as a part of a group that we would want them to be able to be compensated. And I don't think any of us should pretend that this bill is going to get through passage if it has to take a detour through the appropriations committees who have already passed the Q1 budget. So um, so I, I would tend to, uh, to ask the question of, you know, could we could we delegate, um, you know, two members of GovOps and two members of judiciary to, uh, you know, to begin the beginning of August, um, convening conversations with uh, a variety of stakeholders. So the Secretary of State's, uh, you know, records retention folks, the the um, DPS, ACLU, RDAP you know, and, and have it be a subcommittee of these committees who do that work. And just a question on that, Sarah, would that be with an idea of perhaps having a proposed amendment to, I guess I would say S-124, since that's not gonna be done in the next two days and that would be the vehicle? That would be that would be my intention. Would be that this subcommittee could develop something that we would try to pass in August September timeframe. So, can I just ask a question? Sure. <laughs> Why everything is? I I'm just having a hard time following this. There's there's things that are in place, we're going, why can't we just be a little bit patient, see what happens in the next, um, what, two months when we come back here, see where the commissioner is, see where everything, uh, how things have developed, and then decide if we need to go somewhere else. I just feel like we're rushing so much of this that I don't see the point in it. I mean, I think a lot of bases are covered. I think uh, Vermont is a lot different than other places. I, I don't, I feel confident and let's let the people that are already in these positions to do their job. Does anybody understand what I'm saying?
So I definitely understand what you're saying. I, you know, I hear what you're saying, but I also, um, um, I also feel like we have been, uh, we have been sort of circling around some of these issues for quite a while. And with respect to body cams, I think we heard Tanya Marshall say that, you know, that this has been worked on since 2016 and, um, and we still don't have a uniform um, use of body cams or policy governing their use. Um, and so that's why I feel compelled to keep pushing forward and trying to find a way to really compel us to give ourselves a timeline of when we want to have this in place. So let's, so just, just talking on the body cams. So when I was the chairman of the select board in Northfield, right, we went and, and we couldn't get the body cams fast enough right and then once we have body cams and what i'm hearing now because of, of rights of people and all this stuff and how they use and all this stuff which i'm in favor of of uh i'm in favor of body cams because i think it helps it it, it um protects the police it protects a victim and there's evidence there and it's like now i'm hearing that oh all of a sudden you know we're skeptical of body cams it's like no matter what we do, we're not going to protect our, or not everybody is going to be safe. There's going to be, there's always going to be a problem. We're not going to solve every situation that we have out there. And it's going to continue no matter, no matter what. It's a part of life. Thanks. So, so Kenya, no, I, I, um, I do understand what you're saying. I also, we also did hear quite a bit of testimony that um, that there needs, this needs to be a broader conversation that the voices um, mm -hmm. people who are impacted um, by these policies, when there are policies, even when they're not policies, whatever have not been included in this, in this conversation. So I, um, Sarah, I liked your idea and I, I wonder if we could, um, have Bryn or somebody, you know, try to get that into to language at some point. And then um, I suggest that that we look at Bryn's uh, new draft mm -hmm. uh, based on our discussion this morning. And uh, and then and then if we have time, move move back to the uh, to the intent. Uh, so we've got uh, we've got some hands up right now. Our, oh. our folks who want to urgently say something about this issue of body cam policy? Uh, I had my hand up from before, sorry. Okay. Um, Rob, you have your hand up still. Do you want to say something on body cam policy? I do. Um, I actually uh, support your suggestion. I think having a subcommittee work on this and exclusively this and get all the interested parties involved, I think it makes sense to me. No matter how we do this, there's going to be some legislative oversight and input required anyway. And if we can get all the parties around the table, the ACLU, all the interested parties that we've heard from, recognizing that this particular issue is the focus, um, I, I would support that. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Tom? Yeah, I would say ditto to it what Rob just said, but um, I, I had a question for James, again, of course, around the body cams, and I didn't know how familiar he was with what's going on in the Senate and in 124, uh, of course, uh, specifically the section nine with the, the use of the body cams and what the, the what that model policy is from the uh, LEAB. Um, so no, I don't have, 124 in front of me. I, you know, I, I'm filling in for a couple of colleagues. Um, sure. <laughs> but uh, you know, as I say, the, the last uh, I checked in on the LEAB um, was it was a few years ago, and you know, the letter that we submitted, you know, I think is is probably would be the starting point for us in terms of the shortcomings of the LEAB policy. Um, uh, and, you know, again, uh, Leah Ernst, um, you know, if you do go the route of a subcommittee, uh, I think 
I'm hope, hoping I can nominate Leah Ernst to be our point person uh, on that. And I think she, she would have a lot to contribute to that discussion. Um, you know, our, again, our concern was that, as I think somebody read the language of 124, it essentially said, yes, you should get inputs from stakeholders, but the final recommendation comes from the LEAB, which is stacked with law enforcement and now even more so. Um, and, and, you know, as someone said, that's not, not the right direction to go. So, right. um, so look, can I just real, I need to correct that real quickly. I'm sorry, because, uh, 124, it's not going to be more stacked until of course, 124 is passed. But also, there is actually an expansion of, of the individuals, uh, the executive director of racial equity, uh, an individual appointed by the Human Rights Commission. So it isn't just law enforcement. It, it, it in fact, would expand uh, you know, three public members who shall not be uh, law enforcement officers or, or have any association with law enforcement officers. At least that's what I'm looking at right now as far as the council okay. membership. Betsy and uh, Rask has some, uh, some unless that unless that of course didn't actually make it through the Senate. If it, that that's what Betsy Ann is going to tell us. Hi, yeah, you are you are looking at that first page, which is actually in regard to the membership of the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council, which is a separate entity from the Law Enforcement Advisory Board. LEA. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. LEA okay, is still uh, fully. Um, law enforcement related members. Let's get all those other people onto the LEAB as well. Maybe that's an amendment for 124, Sarah, when you take it up. <laughs> Gee, that sounds like fun. The more the merrier. Uh, Hal Colston. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to say I agree with the position of both chairs on this issue and also Representative LeClaire. Thank you. All right. Sounds like we have a direction to go on uh, with respect to the development of body cam policy that we will then have to um, look at again during legislative session in August, September. Um, so I think and, at this point we're going to Sorry, ahead. make sure and, and so we'll need to have some language in 219 to kind of true that up or whatever, yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, so I think what we should do right now is switch gears and go to Bryn with um, another draft. So where can we find? Okay, hello committees. I think that the, the um, new draft has been posted to both committee web pages. It's draft 1.1 of um, House Judiciary's amendment to S219. So I'll wait a moment for everybody to pull that up on their screens. Dated 625? Yes. Okay. So I just wanna start out by saying that this draft, this is just a draft, hasn't been edited. It does not contain any of that, any of the decisions that you just made about um, the body camera policies. So, that section, those six and seven don't look any different. So we're gonna, we'll, we'll work on that next. Um, but it does contain um, some new language in the intent section and some of the other smaller decisions that the committee made um, with respect to other portions of the bill. So I added all of the new language in yellow. So the first new language you see is on page two. It's a new last sentence to that subdivision A in the legislative intent section. And this was in this language, the sentence, the General Assembly is committed to continually assessing the progress made by the state towards developing a system of public safety that is effective, equitable, and maintains the public trust and continuing its work to achieve that goal. So this sentence was designed to kind of drive home the point that this S219 represents um, one step in, in what is an ongoing process towards addressing these, these issues. Okay, I'll keep going. So a bunch of new language down in subsection C. Um, this language is intended to kind of set out the list of things that the General Assembly is committing to taking on in August of this year. Um, the first is considering whether to require law enforcement agencies to adopt the pillars of 21st century policing. The second, 
is considering whether to require law enforcement agencies to be accredited through the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies within the next five years. The third is empowering the Executive Director of Racial Equity to issue subpoenas in the course of um, her work. This is a, a, an issue that might be more familiar to the GovOps Committee since you um, reviewed this language pretty intensely two years ago. Um, subdivision four is adding two full-time positions of data analyst and policy analyst to the agency of administration for, um, to assist the executive director of racial equity in her work. Sixth, or sorry, fifth is resituating the Criminal Justice Training Council to the jurisdiction of the Department of Public Safety. Six is requiring uh, body cameras for all law enforcement agencies and officers, that should probably also say. All officers be equipped with body cameras is probably more appropriate there. Um, seven is reforming qualified immunity for law enforcement. Eight is expanding data that law enforcement is required to collect to include data that stems from all law enforcement initiated interactions with civilians. So not just expanding it from the um, traffic stop data. Nine is evaluating whether to create a new crime that would impose criminal penalties on a law enforcement officer um, that uses a prohibited restraint in the course of his or her duties as a law enforcement officer when that prohibited restraint causes serious bodily injury or death to another person. Um, I put this in here. I don't know if the committees have made a final decision about removing the new crime, but um, I added this language just for your review. And lastly, 10 is considering um, recommendations that come forward through a process of meaningful community engagement, particularly with impacted, marginalized, and vulnerable communities. Thank you. Let's pause there and see if an, either of the committee's membership wants to um, ask a question or make a recommendation on any of these intent uh, pieces. Tom Burdett has a hand up. Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, number three on page, uh, page three, empowering Vermont's executive director of racial equity to issue subpoenas. Um, is that something that's unusual for somebody in that capacity. To me, that sounds more like somebody, I, I think in the judicial system or maybe the state's attorney's office and, and that type of thing. So uh, I'm, I'm just wondering if this is a, a, a new direction we're going with this. Um, I'm not sure I'd say it's unusual. It would have to be uh, granted by statute to for this person to have that authority. Um, but I'm, I don't know if I want to comment on it being unusual. Okay, is there, uh, I guess, is there any other uh, departments in the, in the state that have that power? Um, I would have to look into that and let you know, I'm not sure. Okay, great, thank you. Jim Harrison. Yeah, thank you, I guess I'm, uh, I'm lost. I'm just reading this new draft now, and I'm looking at that section, and I guess I must have been asleep this morning, because I don't remember any of this discussion about adding subpoena power and adding two full-time positions for, uh, I guess, analyzing the data. So um, I, I think we're uh, I don't know. I, I just, I fear we're making this too big. Now it's a new appropriation and um, we've taken a simple bill and made it very complex. So I just, a word of caution from my point of view. So I would, I would just um, say that many of these components are pieces that we have heard um, being expressed as, um, as priorities for the legislature to work on. We have been asked um, either in, in committee session or in um, less formal conversations for many, uh, if all of these, uh, all of these pieces that are expressed as intent 
Um, and I think the what we're aiming for here is is really to um, to make it known through the intent of this bill that we have a broader body of work that we know that we will need to get to. Um, not that this bill is is accomplishing all of that, but that we uh, that we know that these are among the things that we want to do in the future. Uh, Maxine. Right, and these um, many of these were not discussed this morning, Jim. You're correct, and and again, I um, I agree with Sarah. The, um, I took these from things that um, I heard in testimony. Uh, also, um, some of these were um, our coaches' recommendations and testimony that he provided in the Senate. Uh, so again, just for discussion purposes. Um, I also know that we heard from Lori Emerson um, wanting to collect data um, in terms of encounters with um, members of the mental health community. And uh, so I just wanna make sure that we don't lose, lose sight of that. Um, I, and I think her testimony was in regards to section three of the bill, which talks about um, race data and, and and that's where she wanted something added um, regarding mental health and I'm not I'm not sure if it's you know if we're ready to, to or this is even the place to amend it but at least to um, name that as something to to consider yes I, I appreciate that we right. definitely heard that loud and clear. Um. Great. And then also, um, I don't want to lose sight of Ann Donahue's testimony, but I, um, in terms of what we might put in the intent, but I think it'll become more relevant, perhaps when we start talking about the new crime. Yeah. Yep. Um, Rob LeClaire. Well, I guess I'm going to have to echo some of the others as far as the uh, Director of Racial Equity sounds like we're giving her additional staff. Um, what what is the intent? What is she going to do with this information um, that they're going to be compiling? And are we giving this position some sort of authority over law enforcement? Um, and I guess does she have the qualifications to do this? Uh, Selena. There are a number of provisions in the Justice Reinvestment Bill around data collection that um, mandate a key role for um, this office. And so I read, I read because the positions that are described and defined here appear to be around um, collection and analysis of data, I read this as um, us. Uh, hoping to support her capacity to do the work that we've charged her, already charged her with doing as a legislator. Martin. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, just a couple comments about this, this list. I mean, first of all, with respect to what uh, Rob was just saying, you know, we're, we're, not in, we're not doing anything, we're not empowering the executive director of racial equity whatsoever in this intense section, of course, it's just something we'll look at. But my, my concern is, I, I do want, you know, these are all important things that we have to look into. Some of them, I don't really have any idea where my position is on them. Some of them I kind of been pushing, but we don't know how long we're gonna be here in August. Um, and it just may be over promising as far as what we are able to consider. And when we say we'll take up, uh, what precisely does that mean? Uh, I mean, on the one hand, I want individuals to understand that we are very serious about continuing the work on this, but I don't want people to think that we're going to be able to get all this done if we're not going to be here for very long in August and we're continuing to do this all through Zoom. But on the other hand, are we able to even say anything about intent for the next biennium where we can't bind them whatsoever? So I understand that as well. So I don't really have a solution for this. I just wanted to raise that as a concern. 
John Gannon. Thank you. Um, I agree with Martin. I mean, well, I understand this is intent language. I mean, I think there's going to be a promise put out there that we're going to tackle all of this in a couple of weeks in August. And this is a huge list of, of things to accomplish. Um, many that could take hours of testimony to really resolve. So I, I would be worried that we're over promising in this section. How? Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I see this intent list as a vision. So how do we frame it? This is our vision. This is where we want to go. And how we get there is our mission. You know, what's, what's our mission statement? How are we going to execute this? It's going to take time. We can't get it all done in August or September. But I think this is a, a, a lofty goal. And I think it's doable over time. Maxine. Thank you. Yeah, I was thinking something um, along similar lines that we perhaps recognize that this is work that needs to be done or, or is left undone here. But but yes, it is it it is a vision um, and a and a recognition of of the ongoing work. So. Um, Selena? Um, I hear people's concerns about over promising and maybe there's some ways to adjust um, some of this language um, so it's it's clear that this is work we'll pick back up in August but we're not um, necessarily saying we're gonna rush it through. And I think we heard a lot of stakeholders actually asking us not to rush things through. So maybe there's some ways to massage this language, but I would, I also would really caution us about under promising on our commitment um, to this work. And so I'm like Representative Colston, I'm really happy. And, and I think Representative Grad, I'm really happy to see. Um, I'm really happy to see this is such a comprehensive list and, and especially um, think it's important commit to make the commitment that we're gonna also be continuing a meaningful process of um, engagement with folks who told us they didn't haven't felt engaged enough in this work today. Um, so I'd, I'd argue for um, keep keeping the list, but maybe uh, just framing framing the expectations around timing a little differently. Martin. Yeah, I'll throw out just a suggestion for that, just to get the ball rolling on the languages. It is, we could have something along the lines of, it is the intent of the General Assembly to continue to work, including uh, starting in uh, August, when we reconvene in August, uh, on the following issues. Something along that line. I guess, let, I mean, if that's a general idea of where we would go, Bryn, I'm sure could make that same Yep. Um, Rob LeClaire. Well, I find myself in a unique position of agreeing with Martin and um, Hal and I, for goodness sakes, are just, I don't know, I'm so happy today. But I, I do agree with the aspirational part of this, but I think when we're talking about adding positions and different stuff like that, it becomes too prescriptive. And I think that in some cases where we'd let the imperfect stop the good here. Barbara Rachelson. Hi, sorry. Um, so again, if we don't set that aspiration, nobody else is going to. And I'm just wondering um, again about maybe talking about what deliverables we want to see come out of this because as we know the body camera policy is just one piece of it um and maybe we need to just like we use the council of state governments to get help with justice reinvestment maybe one of the things we want to look at even before the data people is getting some 
consultation, both from the ACLU and some national, like maybe the Campaign Zero folks who have a beautiful um, sheet of policies that they show the evidence behind making a difference on these issues and community, community engagement. They have a lot on um, meaningful ways to do that. So it's important to set the wheels in motion, put the vision out there, not over deliver, but really kind of be smart about um, making that vision one that we do get community input on because it's a good starting place to, to do that. And again, if we don't hold the vision out, who is gonna hold it out? That's a good point. Thank you. Um, any other questions from either committee on it, on any of the new intent language before we um, take a cruise through the rest of the bill? All right. Bryn, take it away. Okay, so the next change you'll see, um, there are no changes to those two sections about um, hinging state grant funding to law enforcement on their compliance with race data reporting requirements. Those sections are unchanged. Section four is the race data collection statute, and there are a few changes there. Um, the first is to change the reason for the stop to the grounds for the stop, and then adding some additional language in the following subdivision that um, the grounds for any search that's conducted also be data that's gathered. Um, dropping down a few lines, we've changed effectuated to during. So now it's uh, requiring data collection on whether physical force was employed or threatened during the stop. I'm gonna move down to the next page, page six. Now we're talking about um, the data that is collected and aggregated and um, sent to the vendor for posting, to, for public posting. Um, rather than, rather than user-friendly, we've added some language there to ensure that the data is posted in a manner that's accessible to the public and clear, understandable, and analyzable to a reasonably prudent person. This was a, I took the chair's suggestion that I reach out to the, uh, our attorney who works with the Commerce Committees, and this was his suggestion. Um, that is actually a tort standard. So um, it may, I'll let the committee decide how it wants to deal with that. You could also just say a, the average person. Um, but I'll let you all think about that and I'll keep going. Um, <clears throat> I'm at the top of page seven now. So this is the definition of physical force. And we've changed this so it says that um, it's force that's used by law enforcement enforcement to compel a person's compliance with the officer's instructions that constitutes a greater amount of force than handcuffing a compliant person. So that change was made so we weren't using any terms of art there in case those terms of art change over time. Rob LeClaire has a question. Um, Madam Chair, thank you. I, I'm still hung up on why would I need to be handcuffing a compliant person? Um, I, I think that Nodder can maybe describe this, but even if I am peacefully surrendering because I know that you finally nabbed me after my 10 bank spree, robbery spree, you know, even if I'm not looking like I'm urgently trying to run, um, I think the protocol is to handcuff the person. Go ahead, Donner. Yeah, so, you know, another thing to think about is that people who are getting detained and becoming, um, and entering the custody of the state, you know, after entering that custody, they, it may dawn on them shortly thereafter that they're in, big trouble and then they may change their mind and no longer become compliant. Sometimes people are on drugs and they become combative and it is the general policy that if you are taking somebody into custody, um, they are going to go into handcuffs because they're now in the custody of the state of Vermont. Um, 
And also when you're arresting somebody, you have to perform a search of that person after you arrest them and placing them in handcuffs adds an element of officer safety during that. All right, thank you for that. Maybe I've just watched too much TV here, but it, what I've seen, and again, I haven't had this experience and it's probably not what I'm looking to rush out and have. However, it seems what I've seen is that officers will put somebody in handcuffs I guess for their own safety, but yet the person has done nothing to indicate or give the officer from what I can tell reason to think that they're not safe. I don't know, I'm just, there's something about this that just doesn't strike me as being reasonable. If you're gonna put somebody in handcuffs, then something's saying that they're not going to be compliant. Well, you know, one, there's some, I mean, I get, I don't know if this will answer your question. I mean, there is some level of discretion, very, very little. Um, you know, for instance, if you're processing a DUI, you're going to arrest that person after, you know, on the roadside, after they, after you gather enough evidence that they've committed the crime of DUI, you're going to place them in handcuffs and then transport them back to the barracks or the police department. And, you know, sometimes you'll get a person who, after interacting with them for an hour, you're 100% confident that they're not going to act out in a way and you have them sitting on a bench without handcuffs on so that you guys, so that um, both the cop and the person who got arrested can fill out the paperwork more efficiently. And then, you know, the person apologizes and they're on their way. Other times you get a person who's fine and happy or fine and neutral when they're getting arrested and then 10 or 20 minutes later, when they realize they're going to be sitting in a cell, they start trying to break things and they become violent. Um, and so I, I don't know if that helps clarify things, but if, if somebody's becoming a ward of the state or if they're entering the custody of the state to be detained, then they go in handcuffs, at least initially. So it makes sense to you? It, yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Bob Hooper. Well, I, I will say what I said earlier. I don't have any experience in Notter's area, but when I was working with juveniles, anytime a sheriff's department would come to do a transfer from any residential facility or any other time, the policy was before you get in the car, you get the jewelry on. And that was just policy and it didn't matter who the kid was or what the kid had done uh build as just as safe for them as anybody else but it seemed to be a policy issue and that's kids yeah. uh martin hold on so just, i mean the question really isn't whether one should handcuff a compliant person or not that's we're just using this to set the standard for amount of force so I mean, those are two separate questions. Your concern, I think, uh, Representative LeClaire, is, is not really what we're getting at there. It's just a measure of amount of force, and that's what we're using as a standard. All right, any other questions on this section? All right, let's, uh, Tom Burdett. No, I had one for Nader, and just with the situation that we're talking about, and, you know, and, uh, when you put somebody in handcuffs for whatever reason, did you ever not put somebody in handcuffs uh, uh, just because you had a feeling about them or you knew them or anything like that in, in one of the same situations? You might want to unmute. Uh, no, the, the answer is no. I mean, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of one. Um, I mean, I, I recall arresting a few folks who were uh, morbidly obese and we had to use several handcuffs just for extra length. Yep. Um, there have been a couple times here and there where I've had people sitting in the front seat because they were much older and it was really cold out. And you know, I wanted to make sure they were warm, but they were still in handcuffs. Um, 
maybe a few times of handcuffing people in the front because they had a obvious shoulder or hand injury. And, um, but usually when you handcuff people in the front, you also have a belt that, uh, makes sure that keeps their hands basically right around their belly button, uh, because there's but a hand, loop. But handcuff none, nonetheless. And I'm going to assume yeah. that it was, uh, that, that was driven home in, in, uh, at the Academy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's driven home at the Academy. If you're, if you're going to arrest somebody, then handcuffs are going to be involved unless, I mean, there are also instances where they're getting in an ambulance because they were involved in a car crash and it's a DUI and you're going to be processing them, but you know, they're bleeding from their head and they're in a gurney. So you're just going to go, you're just going to follow the ambulance to the hospital. But even then there are instances where people are injured, bleeding from wherever, and they're still violent and you, you actually do handcuff them to the gurney and then you meet them at the hospital. But if, but, but the handcuffs do go on. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, Gonna miss you with, the, with these questions. Yeah, you can send me text messages. It's fine. Great resource. Uh, so, Bryn, let's uh, let's keep going. Okay. So the next two changes are um, they're actually not changes. They're just words that I highlighted um, to flag for the committee that you had discussed, but I don't think you came to a coalesce around a decision. So the first is on page nine. This is the category B misconduct, failing to intervene. Um, I think that there was some conversation about whether that should be failing to report um, to a superior or something. So I just flagged that. Uh, yes, Tom I could, stand up, as does Maxine. Yeah, if I could add, um, that was a recommendation from um, James Pepper, um, possibly use report instead of intervene, responding to the discussion we had earlier. Uh, Tom? I think that was from before, sorry. Rob, uh, Bob Hooper, did you have, were you leaning in to say something? Uh, yeah, I thought my mic was off, but I said maybe we should consider that it should be both words. Intervene and report. Well, I, I Go ahead, Nader, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, I, I, I agree with Rob, um, but I think it's really important to figure out what an intervention would look like um, because there are times where the cop may be rolling onto a scene and he'll see a, another cop fighting with somebody else and the cop who's arriving at the scene may have no idea why they're fighting. That suspect may be somebody who was trying to stab somebody and now they're going hands-on, or it may be a legitimate excessive use of force or a violation of a person's civil rights. Um, so, you know, it may put that second cop in a weird position where they're wondering, is this a situation where, I'm, where I need to intervene or is it a situation where this suspect is trying to hurt or kill somebody else and I actually need to assist? So that's why I think we, should try to figure out how we define that. Uh, yeah. Martin? Can, can it uh, not be as simple as saying uh, failure, let's see, uh, to intervene when the officer observes another officer improperly placing a person in a prohibited restraint or using excessive force? And that still leaves it relatively broad. I mean, one could really go into it like reasonably. I think that narrows it down. I think that narrows it down a bit more. Yeah. Well, or it, could, or it could be another officer reasonably believes uh, that the other officer is improperly placing a person. I think that would narrow it down and uh, make it make more sense. I would think that Bryn would probably be able to get the, the point of that in better language than I just suggested. But Maxine, thoughts on that? Right, so so two things. One, I would ask Bryn to help us understand what the Senate, the uh, Senate's intent was when it said failing to intervene and why they have that section in here. I, I think the answer would be helpful to bring us back to that. Um, I think the report suggestion comes from this, um, this 
I guess it was afternoon, um, earlier afternoon discussion where um, I think Tom, you brought up the concern uh, about these, um, the ranks um, within um, police officers and, and, and might report, might it be easier for somebody to report than to intervene? I, I think that's what that was getting at, so. So, um, would you would you like me to talk about the Senate's uh, yeah, thinking that'd be helpful. behind? This? So, the Senate uh, had quite a bit of conversation about this uh, prohibited restraint, um, as you could probably tell from the bill as the way it arrived to you. It was, um, I think, that was the portion of the bill that was they heard the most testimony on. Um, it was important to that committee that this restraint be called a prohibited restraint um, as opposed to an improper restraint or something else to make it abundantly clear that it was uh, prohibited for law enforcement to use this type of restraint under any circumstances. Um, so they had some conversation about whether or not it should also be prohibited conduct to um, observe another officer using a prohibited restraint and stand there and do nothing. Um, so this really came up in the context of uh, having the same sort of uh, opportunity for sanctioning for an officer who um, took no action if they knew that another officer was using a prohibited restraint. Uh, Martin? So, so does it help if there's a, a reasonableness standard in there, or did they talk about that at all? Is that necessary? I understand what you're saying by by interjecting improperly. It goes against all what they were talking about because you know, having watched some of what they were listening to, but should there be uh, you know just an officer observes uh, as opposed to an officer? I'm just wondering if reasonableness should be put in there or if that's not necessary. I think. I mean, I, that's up to you. I, I would say the Senate was very concerned that um, that officers are frequently able to um, avoid sanctions or criminal charges for conduct based on that reasonable standard. Um, so in this instance of the prohibited restraint, just in this one uh, sort of narrow instance of police um, excessive use of force, the intent there was to make it very clear that the conduct was prohibited. Um, and not put in any um, reasonable standard or other qualifying language that may um, make it easier for an officer to avoid um, experiencing a sanction for this kind of conduct. So the officer is going to have to make a judgment call in Nader's scenario that he raised that uh, they drive into a situation of whether the other officer is using a prohibited restraint uh, as opposed to in a self-defense situation or using excessive force as opposed to the self-defense situation as it's written. Is that correct, Ren? Will you say that again? I'm sorry, I don't think I followed well, very well. Well, just the situation where an officer comes on a scene where uh, uh, another officer is in some sort of struggle with another person there's going to have to be a judgment call of whether what's happening is prohibited or excessive or not. Yes, and I think that the testimony that, that the Senate heard was that there's um, that sort of response from by the officer is going to be a part of the decision that's made by the agency in considering whether to discipline an officer and also it will be taken under consideration by the council in their decision of whether and how to sanction that officer. So it's a little different from a, from a crime where you really have to uh, establish each element of the crime in order to, to uh, be subject to the, to the penalty associated with that crime. Maxine. Um, unmute, you wanna unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, Bryn, when you were describing this, you used the words, um, I think it was failing to take any action or remember what you said, um, that that's so, they used intervene to talk about inaction or not taking any action. And I wonder if that's too, if we, if we go back to that, to action, if, if that's too broad um, or vague. 
use some some sort of language about failing to take any action. I think that maybe that goes to the point that Representative Hooper made about um, whether you want this to read instead failing to report or intervene or or both. Um, if you want to make it more specific, what kind of action is required here? Do you remember how? Because when you phrased it, it said, "Did you say that take no action?" Do you remember how you phrased it? Because that to me seemed like it was it was right. it was broad, uh, broader so, than intervene. Yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to characterize um, the Senate's testimony too concisely because they they did take a, quite a bit of testimony. But it's my recollection that their conversation was really about. Um, wanting to ensure there was some penalty associated with um, a failure to intervene in these kind of circumstances. If one officer observes another using this prohibited restraint, um, that person would not be able to sort of escape from that situation without any consequences. Thank you. Um, Here we go. Tom, I think you're unmuted now. Oh, okay. It wasn't showing I was muted. Huh, okay. Anyway, I'm here. So um, in G, failing to intervene, and, and uh, I, I, I think, Bryn, that you said the, uh, I don't know if I'd say the intent of the Senate, but what, what they had talked about is a, uh, a prohibited restraint under this meaning is a restraint that uh, can't be used, period. Is, is, that, is that right? Yes, I would characterize much of the conversation in the Senate as wanting to ensure that this was, uh, it was quite clear that this is the type of restraint that should not be used by law enforcement. Right. Okay, so, so with that said, uh, in this language here, uh, how would that apply since we took, uh, we took out section five? Um, it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't apply because section five is gone. And that's my guess. Well, this, this is different. Section five imposed a criminal penalty for a law enforcement officer who, who used a prohibited restraint that resulted in serious bodily injury or death. And this is, um, in the unprofessional conduct sub chapter here of the, of the council chapter in title 20. So this is like a professional professional sanctions as opposed to criminal sanctions. And there okay. is still a definition. And there's still the definition, right? Okay. So this, so by removing oh, right below five, it. Okay, yeah. Right. So if, if you're going to remove section five, the criminal sanction, you, you you're saying that this prohibited restraint is subject to professional sanctions and not criminal sanctions. Except for if a law enforcement officer was charged under an assault statute. Right, right. Oh, okay. I may have more questions, but thank you. John Gannon. Thank you. So, I mean, the, the failing to intervene with when there is a prohibited restraint seems to be, I don't think there's an issue around that because if, if an officer is fighting for his life, you'd want the other officer to intervene anyway. If the officer is using a prohibited restraint and is doing it like it appears what happened in the George Floyd matter, then you want him to intervene in that situation too. So that one's easy, I think, to un unwrap. The one that's more challenging, and I think Nader pointed this out, was, you know, if you come on the scene, how do you determine if somebody's using excessive force or not? That, that is a judgment call. I mean, if we took that out, the excessive force part, then I think it, this is easier to deal with, but that's just my thought. Thanks, John. Um, Hal. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to go back to section four before we close out uh, real quick. Um, and on page five, on line five, you know, we haven't touched on um, collecting data ar around folks with a mental health crisis. And in GovOps, we heard significant and compelling 
testimony from advocates from the mental health community. So I'm wondering if you might consider after race and mental health data, and then after line 21, to insert some language to the effect and whether the person stopped was acting in a manner that gave the officer reason to believe the person was in a mental health crisis. Because we're not collecting anything from this draft about mental health data. Hmm. Right, and that's that's what I had um, spoken about in the intent language, or um, whether or not to put it there. Or I had I had originally um, asked about something similar to that Hal just mentioned, um, based on Lori Emerson's testimony. And we've heard other testimony in GovOps that really, yeah. I mean, I, I believe half of the folks who are killed at the hand of police are suffering mental health crises. So that's an important piece in this section. And I think, I don't know how we get it in there, if it just stays an intent, but I think it's, a, it's an oversight if we don't call it out at this stage of the game. I agree that that is a nagging worry in the back of my mind. Um, uh, I also don't want to try to rush something through unless unless we feel pretty yeah. comfortable that um, that we're asking for the observation. I mean, that's <laughs> it's hard to imagine that there's a yeah. lot of consistency in terms of whether you observe somebody who's uh, you know angry and belligerent or whether you assess that they are yeah. having a mental health crisis. So I, it, it worries me how we would, mm -hmm. I mean, it, yeah, I, I agree that we need to keep working on that. Okay. Jim. Yeah, no, I just, I was going to echo the same thing. I, I think it's an important uh, thing we should follow. Um, I just, I don't know how much a law enforcement officer will be able to judge uh, and categorize someone um, that's in a, a, a stage of mental uh, illness. Uh, I mean, it, it just, it's hard. It would be hard to define. Uh, and if I'm not saying we shouldn't, uh, we should try to. Um, other thoughts on that or, um, or moving back down to the question that we were on before failing to intervene? Bob Hooper, are you, are you leaning in to raise your hand? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> I'm reading your body language. Through <laughs> I'm leaning in because my glasses don't let me see the difference. Yeah, Sarah, I, or group, I, I think I'm okay with leaving it as, as is. Or at, or report, intervene or report. But I think, I think intervene after listening, I think, I think having intervene there is, is important. Yeah. Martin? I like our report as well. I think putting intervene or report, I'm definitely in favor of that. Okay, Tom? Am I unmuted this time? You are. <laughs> right. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'm, I've got a question. Uh, let's see, uh, page nine, number seven. So with, with number seven prohibited, the definition of prohibited restraint. So does that make it, uh, I guess you could say illegal with to to use these restraints. Period. It makes it category B unprofessional conduct to use that kind of restraint. Period. Okay, uh, but could it be deemed necessary? Mm -hmm. 
I, again, the count the law enforcement agency and the criminal justice training council, I imagine is going to hear from the officer. The officer is going to explain what happened. They, they do have the opportunity to do that. Um, and that will be taken into consideration if it was the kind of situation where the officer used this prohibited restraint in order to save him or herself or somebody else. So, um, the, I don't. I do not think that because it's Category B conduct, it's defined as Category B conduct. It is across the board um, going to be something that a person is sanctioned for. Right. Yeah. I, I just. I think it's. It just sounds. To me, it sounds kind of funny to call something a prohibited restraint that's uh, going to save uh, an officer's or somebody else's life. It just makes no sense to me at all. And, and uh, I'm just, I'm having a, a lot of trouble with, with that, with number seven, so. Bob Hooper. Um, this is probably inappropriate to say of Tom, but put it in the context of shooting somebody that's normally prohibited also, but in a protection of life, it's sometimes accepted. But the point that I wanted to make though, is that and when we talk about the word report, we're kind of advancing this to the level of a crime. And I wouldn't want to put an officer in the position of having to make a judgment as to whether a crime was being committed. It's more the department's and the council's responsibility. So, you know. so I guess I would ask whoever would, would uh, in a situation Bob was just talking about, if somebody was shot, is that, does that rise to the same level or, or, or would that be on the same level as prohibited restraint as far as the uh, being scrutinized? There's always a review when you shoot somebody, I think. Right, right. But I didn't know if it, if it was similar, similar language that with, with, you know, discharging your firearm or uh, prohibited restraint if, if they're uh, putting them on the same, same level. Because it, it would make me feel more comfortable if there's, uh, you know, similar language around discharging your firearm, I guess. Uh, is, is well, the, I don't know how current it is, but Nader can speak probably more to currents, but it used to be that anytime you discharged your firearm, you came up for some sort of internal review with the state police anyway. Right, right. I, I guess it would be more toward Bryn if, if we have, if, if it's a similar... Uh, uh, I guess you could say infraction or charge or whatever, whatever the right word is. Um, um, is it the same level for firing your, uh, your, your gun and prohibited restraint? Well, um, so it could firing your, your, uh, your discharging your weapon could be considered category a conduct if it's, uh, if it's done, um, illegally if it constitutes a felony. Um, obviously that would be a crime if the officer committed a crime. Uh, category B conduct could mean gross professional misconduct um, amounting to actions on duty um, that involve a willful failure to comply with uh, a state required policy. Um, so if I think that you've heard testimony that um, law enforcement agencies have their own use of force policies so any substantial deviation from a use of force policy, if the if the officer discharged their firearm in a way that was counter to the to the, the agency's use of force policy, could be considered category B conduct. Um, and I think the idea was the intent here was because po policies, it's not um, there is not a statewide universal policy on these prohibited restraints. Um, if this, if the legislature wanted to prohibit law enforcement officers from using them, they should um, be considered category B conduct so that um, an officer would be subject to sanctions if they used one. Okay, so these would be, and you said uh, firing your, uh, uh, discharging your firearm is potentially a category A, is that what you said? Well, it depends on the circumstances, I no. mean, uh, I, I only say that because if, if, you know, if the officer wound up um, 
being charged if they if for example if it was a sort of situation like the situations that we've been hearing about around the country where the officer discharged a weapon in the back of a person who was running away and if law enforcement wound up being charged with a crime then yes that could be considered category a conduct um right. whereas if it's a more um if it's if it's a situation with more nuance um and the, and it was considered an uh, uh an excessive use of force that may be an egregious departure from the from the agency's policy and then it could be considered category b conduct i guess it, I, I i don't totally understand obviously <laughs> um but i i would just have trouble with a prohibited restraint rising to a level higher than firing a um uh, shooting a firearm but um i guess i've got to figure yes. that out yep I think you know this was it was talked about a little bit in the in the course of the um, testimony on the bill about excessive use of force and use of deadly force, whether or not there should be a statewide policy that prohibits this conduct. Um, and since that um, that the the sort of progression of that bill didn't um, carry forward, this was the idea for how to prohibit this conduct um, in a meaningful way. Okay, thank you. So committees, just the, in the interest of time here, I do see four or so hands up to uh, to either ask questions or weigh in on this. So I'm wondering if maybe we should take take a time out from this right now and go to the floor. Um, and I have um, I have an, a new Zoom meeting set up for 15 minutes after the floor. You should see an invitation from Andrea Hussey, who's GovOps committee assistant, um, for us to come back to this. And so we can pick up where we left off. And um, and when we get back in, it, uh, as we come back to this section of the bill, please raise your hand again. And in the meantime, I guess I would just encourage folks to continue reviewing not only the rest of this draft that we started looking at, but uh, but also um, take a peek at your emails to see uh, other thoughts and, and observations that are being offered by folks on these topics. And, and can I just ask folks to review their notes? My notes say that um, Mike O'Neill uh, supported this section that we've been talking about. And that's that, that's what worth noting. Um, I think that's important to understand that um, that he was comfortable with that. Thank Maxine, you. were you talking about number seven, the prohibited restraint? That whole section, yeah, what um, the section that you were concerned with and um, okay. and so I just no that that's uh, that's comforting. Thank you. Okay, and I want to, I, and I want to make sure everybody have those same notes or agrees with that. But that was my understanding of the testimony. All right. So, Bryn, are you available to join us yet again for this afternoon? Yes. Yeah, so um, the plan is to look at a, another new draft at that point with the that language about the body camera policy. Oh, absolutely. That would be a great idea if we could take a look at that. Thank you. Yeah, and Bryn, I'll actually, um, I've come up with uh, some new language in the findings um, about the um, uh, position softening, changing that language a little bit. So I'll, I'll email that to you now. Great. Okay, thank you. All right, see you all back here after the floor.